Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Back in the office, back to work very soon. And so much going on that you haven't seen me in almost a month. Why? Well, this girl has been through the ringer. Let me tell you why. <laughs> So, just about a month ago, actually, when my last video posted, it was already, I was into it for two to three days. My mom was taken to the hospital the end of July and has been there ever since. It was, for the first few weeks, extremely touch and go. Um, they had me... Uh, thinking about what she would want um, in terms of end of life. I was uh, making some pretty difficult decisions. Um, there were days when I didn't know if she was going to survive. She was on life support. She was comatose. And if you've caught on, these are past tenses I'm using because she's now awake. She is now moved from the ICU, intensive care unit, to the IMCU, which in our hospital system is one step towards being into a regular ward room and going home. Right? It's amazing because in this last month, she's gone from call the priest in to... Uh, let's talk about long-term recovery. So what happened? Well, about, like I said, it was the end of July, about a month ago, that my mom was pretty sick. So she thought she had the flu or something similar. This is not COVID related. Let me put that right there. Totally not. No coronavirus in this sickness. But she was sick, so she was vomiting, she had diarrhea. Um, I'm sure she'll love me for putting that out there on the internet. And so with the illness, being sick for a few days, she was extremely dehydrated. Um, she wasn't eating because she couldn't keep anything down. That had been pretty much ongoing since she had a hip replacement last year. But not extreme, like there were bouts of it, but it wasn't extreme long, you know, stretches of time. But it definitely, you know, there were times where you were asking yourself, like, this isn't normal. You should, shouldn't be this tired. You shouldn't be this sick or feeling this miserable this often. So anyway, came right down to it, rock bottom she collapsed ambulance was called she was taken to the hospital i have I'm gonna cover her name here have the bill ambulance bill um and of course that day that was the 29th of july that day uh, I had known she was sick. I had talked to her that morning and the deal was that she had somebody coming in. She had an aid person with her, <coughs> pardon me. And, um, so I was due to call her in the evening to check on her. So before I could call her, her phone called me. So I thought, okay, she must be feeling better. If she's calling me and when I answered it was a neighbor of hers telling me informing me that EHS the paramedics were on scene and mom was going to the hospital so of course I spoke with the paramedics answered some questions for them because she was not really lucid and then told them I'll meet you at the hospital see I'm 
my mother's only next of kin. She has siblings. She has mom still alive, my grandmother. Um, but in our immediate family, it was mom, dad, me, and my brother. Now, my dad and my brother are both passed on. So it's just me and my mom. And um, I have her power of attorney. So because she couldn't answer any questions on her own, really, um, and I'd be there regardless, but because I needed to answer medical questions, I was like, I beat the hot, uh, ambulance to the hospital. They wouldn't let me in. That's COVID related. Um, all hospitals are on pretty much lockdown. If you have a reason to be there, you can be there, but otherwise you're not allowed in the building. Um, so yeah, I, uh, got to the hospital before the ambulance and they wouldn't let me in. So they gave me a number to call and said, wait a half an hour. And once she's triaged and registered, then we'll let you in. So I left and I went to her apartment to make sure everything was locked up. Everything was, you know, copacetic. Um, and then went back to the hospital. I called and they said, yep, yep, she's here. You can come. So I went there and, of course, masked up and washed hands, Purell'd, all, all of that. Went in. She was in a room. Within five minutes, the doctor came in. And she answered a few questions for the doctor, although she was, like, eyes half closed, hand up, not just not feeling well. Um, and my mom's, like, this big. She's a tiny, tiny woman. And anyway, so I gathered up her belongings that came with her um, and they moved to her room. And then the doctor wasn't sure what was going on. So we had to go for tests. So that happened. Then they moved her to another area of the emergency room where it was like right across from the nurse's station. That's because mom, the, I talked to the ambulance paramedics uh at around 5 p.m i got finally was allowed in the hospital by 6 30 p.m uh and mom was intubated at 8 30 p.m and by this time lab worked uh ct scan ultrasound ekg this was all done within that time but she went from answering some doctor's questions to being completely delusional and out of it to being intubated and completely unconscious like that. And nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew. So there were questions as to what medications is she on? She's, you know, she's 65. So there she's on some medications. She's on some like vitamins and supplements, stuff like that. Uh, she's diabetic. So yeah, she's on that medication. So that came up, uh, because her kidneys were failing. Actually, no, her kidneys had failed. I don't even think they were failing. They had failed. Um, and that's really what caused her to be sick. At the end of the day, let's cut to the chase. Her kidneys failed. Why? I hate to scare a lot of you out there, but her kidneys failed because of the metformin for her diabetes. Now, granted, she was, at the time she came in the hospital, she was severely, severely dehydrated. When you're dehydrated, your kidneys uh, can't function well. The metformin mixed in that situation causes a toxicity called lactic acidosis. And that's what mom had. My mother was completely um, full of lactic acid. And when I say full of it, I mean somebody who had been in a severe car accident or had a severe infection would be on a level of like say having a level of three lactic acid in their body my mother was at like 18 so she was she was lactic acidosis kidney failure her blood pressure wouldn't regulate uh then she had a cardiac episode 
then um oh yeah it just the list kept growing 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 as to her ailments <sighs> that night two doctors prepared me for the worst and said your your mother is very sick and she most likely will not make it the worst sentences i've ever heard so i stayed at the hospital that night until she was moved to icu intensive care um that was 4 30 in the morning then i went home i had to get some sleep in order to my brain to function i couldn't get sick i mean mom needed me i had to be continued to take care of myself even though it was extremely you know difficult for me to do so but when push comes to shove you do what you have to do for your family so i went home had a little rest as much as i could then i went back to the hospital first thing in the morning I see you uh, because mom was so critically ill they let me come in uh, they let me be there pretty much the whole day same with the next day um, now that's significant because COVID our hospital has a strict policy of visitors only one visitor the same visitor per week um, and you're only allowed one hour a day unless the patient is dying and then you're permitted to be with them and you're permitted two people. So because mom was so critically ill, they allowed me to be in there and I had to be there to answer doctor questions, uh, sign consent forms, um, the next day, which, so she went in on a Wednesday night. So Thursday I was permitted to be there. Then Friday, Thursday night, Right up until 11 p.m., I had doctors calling me, asking for per permission for this and that. And then Friday, I went in, and I was there all day. And I spoke to two surgeons. They wanted to do, because they didn't know what was wrong with her, they wanted to do an exploratory surgery on her abdomen to see if there was an obstruction in the bowel. And so I had to consent to that. Um, at this point, this was Friday, the doctors, there was two surgeons I spoke with and three doctors, three other doctors. So that's five. And all five were telling me that without the surgery, she won't make it. And we need to move her to palliative care to make her comfortable at the end. With surgery, she has a 10% chance of survival. So I said, okay, 10% is better than nothing. Let's go for it. Do the surgery. So pins and needles until the surgery was complete. And I got the call from the surgeon saying she did well. She's back in ICU. We opened her up. Everything's healthy. Well, then what do we do now? <laughs> she's in a coma. Uh, medical induced coma you thought it was her bowel her bowel is healthy what the hell's wrong with my mother so back to the drawing board and mom's still very sick she's on a ventilator she's on there was at least seven to ten IV bags going at once she had central line in her neck um, she had IVs all over. Then with the amount of fluids I had to give her because of how dehydrated she was, she was then blowing up swelling. So her swelling caused, eventually caused edema. So her skin started to break down. This woman has been through hell and back. So while she was sedated and in a coma, I, of course, I talked to her all the time. Then they stopped the sedation on set Sunday. So Friday she had her surgery. Sunday they stopped sedation. And by the following Thursday, she still hadn't woken up. 
not on sedation. She was on a painkiller that would make her sleepy, sure, but she was not waking up. So finally, she started to come to, and the uh, one eye would open, and then two eyes would open. Then now, both eyes are wide open. Anyway, um, she started to come to, but with a ventilator, no communication. She'd squeeze a hand if you asked. She would raise her eyebrow. She'd close her eyes if you asked. She would move her foot. So she was following some commands. And so neurologically, we weren't sure where she would fall, where she would end up. Um, then add another two weeks on. So we're a month in. And she's moved from ICU, IMCU, uh, and which is still an intensive care unit between ICU and a regular room. So, she's in there. She's still, she has a tracheotomy now. And she got that in ICU because the longer you have the ventilation tube in your throat and with the amount of swelling she had, she couldn't swallow. She couldn't, she couldn't breathe without that tube. The longer you have it in, it could cause pneumonia. There's all kinds of issues. She probably would have died because of having the ventilation in her throat. So we opted for the tracheotomy because that gave her the best chance of survival. So she has a tracheotomy and she had, um, a collar, a humidity collar over it because uh, she has secretions on the lungs to help that. Uh, now she has a heat and humidity plus oxygen on that now. She's at 25% oxygen. Um, so she's still really not breathing on her own, although she's down to minimum oxygen, which is terrific. Um, she's doing most of the breathing herself. She just has a little bit of aid, but she still has a lot of secretions on her lungs. That has to come up, and that's probably built up from having the ventilator for so long. Um, they say it's perfectly normal to wean off the ventilator very, very slowly after how long she's been on it. Um, so I'm not too worried about that. Then she has, of course, she's pretty much bedridden. They had her up walking a few steps. They put her up in a chair every day, but they use like a hydraulic lift and uh, put her up in a chair. Um, yeah, she's she's still really, really sick. She can't really communicate. She has uh, a really hard time communicating because I personally can't read lips very well, especially if somebody is has a trach in, has all these other things going on and, and uh, talking like that. It's very difficult. So um, I tried my best and some things I understand and some things she just gives up and she gets frustrated. I totally get that. Oh my God. Could you imagine waking up? You're in the hospital for a month. You're in the hospital for a month. Now you're in a, a ward kind of room with other people. And yeah, that would be depressing. And she is a little depressed and a little sad and a little angry. And probably, 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 probably a lot more emotions going on than I can even understand. So I just have to be there. So today I go in in three hours um, for my one hour a day. So I'm go it's right now it's 9 a.m. And so I'm going in at noon. And well, I'm not sleeping well. I haven't slept well since she went in the hospital. I honestly thought I even checked with my local cemetery where our family is buried to make sure that her plot was ready. Um, because that's how, that's how end of life 
they had me preparing for. Uh, I now know there's the positives that come out of this. Mama is on the road to recovery. Thank God. Because I really, really, my, everybody's been praying. My grandmother, me, uh, all her siblings, all her nieces and nephews, uh, family, other friends and other family. Um, there must have been 50 or more people praying. But what I learned, my biggest lesson I've learned through this is mom had listed me as her power of attorney to make big decisions. And I mean the big ones, like do I pull the plug kind of decisions. And when we were getting to that kind of discussion with the hospital, I felt strong enough to make that decision if that decision was required. I didn't know if I had that strength prior to this because that's a, that's hard. That is like making a decision to put down your dog after, you know, they've lived a long life is a hard decision. Making a decision to pull the plug on a family member. Oh, so many things go through your mind. Like, what if I said, yeah, go ahead and stop all life support and she was going to be fine? Or what if she's fine, but is living with aid that she clearly outlined in her do not resuscitate order that she did not want to live with, like a feeding tube and a breathing apparatus and stuff like that. So... Yeah, there are questions on both sides. Like, if I do it, and she could have lived. Or if I let her live, and she didn't want to. Oh, So, I had that plane on my mind. And my family was so supportive. And whatever decision, we know it's the right one. That was so helpful. Uh, Mom wakes up. Although she can't physically communicate and talk, she can mouth words and kind of lip uh, sync, I guess, what she wants to say. And I asked her, again, I'm, she's not fully lucid yet, but I asked her, I said, are you mad at me? Like, are you happy that you lived? And she said, yes. So as sad as she is, I'm going to take that and run with it. I'm going to feel confident in that, that she is happy. And deep down, she's happy she survived. So that being said, yeah, there are going to be struggles. There's going to be ups and downs. There are going to be turns and twists and Lord knows what else. But that's why I haven't been online. That's why you haven't really seen me in socials. You've missed me here. Because I've been going to the hospital and praying and taking care of my mother. Well, until next week or maybe next day. I don't know how many of these I'm going to end up doing in a week. But I'll commit to myself to one video a week as I had been doing prior to this. And if I miss a week or two, just know... It's because I have a lot going on and I will be back. All right. I love you all. Till next time.